I would actually say that our audience for today are people who are not as involved in the data piece. Yeah. And, and that's part of what's hard is that there's like this abstraction of like data. Like I can just go in the SIS and there's data, but there's this whole process that you have to understand in order then to make requests for data to understand where it comes from. Right. So it's a really important point that we are not in any way talking today about hard data measurements. We are talking about the kind of the, the, what's that? Like the environment of data on your campus and how you yeah. understand it. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Rachel phillips Buck, VP for Student Success at Ferris Resources, joined today by Matt Boisvert, our president. Hey, Matt. Hi, Rachel. You've joined us for episode 73 of Cap and Gown. 73? That's crazy, Gown. That wow. is crazy. And it's May. Happy May. It is May. I am. I have spring fever. I don't know if that's <laughs> happening to you, Matt, but I'm like ready for ready for summer to come, for the spring semester yeah, yeah. to be over. Um, <clears throat> it's pretty beautiful weather. We were laughing about rhythm of the academic year. So welcome to May, everybody. Very exciting. Um, all of the things still about going home and the stress of that. That's where our students are thinking about roommates for next year. Right. Considering maybe for the first time about not coming back. Right. So this is an interesting phenomenon where it's like committed for two semesters because it's pretty hard to move in the middle of the year. But then you're about to go home for a summer, which gives you distance from your institution. So you're like, I don't know if I want to go back and do that. Right. It's just there's wow. just a lot going on, which is why registration, not registration is so important. Because we got to get them connected to us while you can. Oh, before they leave campus, it, it's critical. Yep. Yeah, so perfect. I think. All those, everything we talk about, like creating collisions, just being in their spaces and, and just encouraging them, you yeah. know. Okay. So I have a couple of housekeeping things. First of all, um, if you are one of the schools, in one of the schools that we have the privilege to serve, you've heard from us before, but I just want to remind you that we do a boot camp. Um, it's coming up June 1st and 2nd. This is just like a really intensive training. You do this by work team. So you register a couple of uh, people. I think it's three people on a work team. And then we spend two days just going through all this stuff. If you do our stoplight, no, our spotlight sessions in the spring, you probably are well equipped. But if you have other people on your campus that you want to kind of get integrated into the system and kind of knowing all the tips and tricks and all of that, then we would love for you to join us. So there's information about that. Yeah. Um, Matt, Great. we are going to be back next week. I think that um, I think we're going to talk about career next week. And then we're taking two weeks off because of travel. So um, I'm going to be in, well, we'll both be in North Carolina and then I'm going to be in, where am I going after that? ACA. You're going, you're going to Tennessee and then, and then we'll be in South Carolina. Oh, Okay, well, we'll be we'll be here next week, and then our last um, episode of the season will be on the thirtieth, and then we take the summer off, and then we will come back in August. So just so yeah. that you know, um, but we're so happy that you guys, some of you are joining us on LinkedIn Live. So thank you for that. I also know so many of you are taking time out of your day while you're washing dishes or walking the dog or whatever else you do while you're listening to podcasts. So thank you. You know, you can find us anywhere that you listen to your podcast. We are delighted to be able to spend time with you. So, <clears throat> Matt, you get to yeah. do my least favorite job. I love it. I just don't want it to be my job. So will you do our joy words? Oh, oh yeah. Joy words. This is from the book Happiness Found, Happiness Found in Translation. And the first word of the day oh, is from Sweden. It's Muta, okay. okay, muta, which is to enjoy deeply and intensely, to appreciate profoundly, to love life. Nice. So, need some muta in your life. Muta, okay. The next one is Ubuntu. This is uh, Zulu, and it is 
universal kindness and benevolence, a spirit of common humanity. And I love this. I am because you are. Mm. That's, pretty neat. That's, a great that's a great one. one. Yeah, that's a great one. All right. And then um, now this one is Norwegian. So I'm going to try. You've been there. I haven't actually been to Norway, but uh, all right. Let me let me start over. Okay. It's free loops leave, free loops leave. Oh. And uh, so Norwegian, it means, and you would understand this as you've been there, open air life. Oh, yeah. Appreciation and enjoyment of the outdoors, engaging and living in, in tune with nature. Yeah, I love I that. Like you did that. They you for sure, yes, they for sure embrace that in Norway. It's just so beautiful, and the weather is so lovely when I go in the summers, not not in the winter. But yeah. they for sure embrace all of those things. Well, Free loop sleeve. Thanks for those joy words. Um, now it's time for State of the Union. <laughs> All right. The first thing that I have for you in State of the Union is the ever evolving um, NIL story with NCAA and what's happening for athletes. States are now getting involved. They're trying to figure out um, basically how to remove barriers between college athletes and the schools that they play uh, that, for which they play. So there's a bunch of different laws that are being passed, Arkansas, Texas, Colorado, where um, schools can facilitate some of this, what is it, name? Image likeness. Image likeness. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so the NCAA has said schools are not allowed to be in charge of this for students. And now these laws are coming in and saying, Actually, they can't enable these opportunities for students. The exact language is that any 501c3 entity is allowed to sort of intervene with these students and help them with opportunities. Those specifically refer to athletic fundraising foundations affiliated with universities. So, for example... There's a 12th Man Foundation, which is a private organization that raises funds for scholarships and programs and facilities for A&M athletics. Okay, so it's Texas private, a but it's affiliated with Texas A&M. They have now created a new division within the foundation that operates like a collective, which basically means these are just a bunch of individual people who are doing what they do. It's not, there's no like mandate. It's just, we're, you know, just, we're just cooperating with each other. And that is now the primary source of NIL compensation for college athletes. So those people are allowed to pay uh, athletes and facilitate payment for them. It is not the institution doing it, but it is affiliated with the institution. So NCAA really doesn't like this. They're like, this is a terrible idea. It's going to be a wreck. It's all of their, they're like, all of these reviews say that the NIL deals can be expletive, not, not expletive, exploitive um, for student <laughs> athletes. And the NCAA, I mean, if all of these states pass different laws, then how can the NCAA enforce anything? Because they're going to be state law. Anyway, it's just kind of a wreck. Yeah, that's a great summary. It's really interesting, um, you know, so what's really interesting in this NIL, so I went to um, uh, the state capitol and heard about this, and they and they were talking about, I mean, it's, it's very hard if you're below, let's just say, the top 50 programs, football programs, um, it's very hard to compete because you've got so much money going to these athletes yeah. from these foundations, so... Yeah. Well, I, I like these kinds of stories because I think it's so interesting how they evolve, right? So over the last, 2021 is when it started. So over the last two years, just watching like, oh, this changed. Now, what about this? What about this? And so it'll, I mean, this is just one, like we had a couple last week where it's like, just keep your eye on that because these oh, yeah. subtle changes are going to make a huge difference um, we were talking about even students entering the transfer portal, like athletes entering, because now they can do that, right? So 
you can lure students away if you give them a better deal in athletics. It's it's pretty interesting. Okay. And it's very competitive, right? Between yeah. all these programs. So for sure. There will be a lot of, I mean, so this is exactly what you're saying. There's going to be a move and a counter move and then a, another move just yeah. to attract the best talent to your team. All right. There's a new program in Maryland. The governor um, on Monday is supposed to sign into law a bill that is called the uh, Serve Act Law. I really like this. High school graduates who are accepted into the program will be able to serve in areas like education, conservation, literacy, and veteran affairs for a year before they go to college. And then after they've done that service, they get $6,000 to use towards the college that they're going to go to. So graduates from high school can apply up to three years after they get their diploma. So they have a little wow. bit of time in there. The governor is saying, we really like this because when you have students who aren't sure what to do about their career, like I don't, I don't, I'm not exactly sure what the major is. I don't have enough experience. If they can do a year of service at a nonprofit or a public agency or a for-profit that will allow them to get the hard and soft skills that make them more marketable at the end of their uh, service. So they're starting with 200 applicants. They hope to grow it to 2000. I think what he said there is really interesting because it's not only the experience, but you can imagine then building your resume, just like Matt, you and I would talk to college students about, right? Like over the four years of college, you want to be building your resume so that when you graduate, you can go to your dream job and say, look, I've done everything that you would want me to do. I have all those experiences. Well, for some students thinking about applying to college, they don't have the kinds of experiences that right. college wants want to see. So putting them light years ahead to be able to say, I went and did this program. Here's everything I learned. Here's what I was in charge of. Here's what I experienced. Not only gives them that kind of experience, but also sets them up to be more uh marketable for colleges. So I like that. Also, it's just good. It's good for the community. It's just good. So I was just wondering, like, how did Maryland, of out of 50 states, this is Maryland stepping yeah. forward and putting this in into motion. It's really great. My brain is in data because this is what we're going to talk about yeah. today. But I'm really yeah. curious to know of those students, how many of them actually choose to go on to college? And it, are there any of them that say, I can keep doing what I'm doing. I like it. I'm just going to keep, I'm going to pursue this kind of opportunity, right? I'm thinking about that specifically because so many governments, especially in the last like six months, are taking away the college degree requirement for governmental jobs. And we haven't talked about that, but I'm just thinking, yeah. And so it's really interesting to think about, is this a place where then they actually opt out of college or are they always going to come back and say, yeah, I, I see what I want to do and I need a college degree to do that. So pretty interesting. Yeah. Um, in Illinois, on the other hand, we have a bill to create um, an income share agreement. So, well, that's not exactly true. We have a bill to put guardrails on this idea of income share agreement. So this, you may remember, is a pretty controversial method of financing college education. It's where you allow a college graduate to pay back their tuition and fees through a monthly portion of their salaries over a set time frame after they graduate with very little setup cost. So like you can come to college for free. And then after you graduate, we're going to take a portion of your income until you've paid everything back. So uh, critics of ISA say these deals are really hard to parse. Also, they're potentially saddling students with greater debts because they don't have governmental oversight. Here's two pieces of information that make me very worried about this idea. I think, I actually think in the long run, it's a good idea, but I think you have to be very careful of this. Like Matt, you remember we were talking about like when your son was going to school and we were like, it's such an interesting idea. Like you buy a share of your son because I think he's going to be successful, right? So you could be like, hey, right. I'm going to buy a share and then here, give you money for school. And then when you're successful, then I get, anyway, I think there are some ways that it could work. Um, but right now the draft legislation in Illinois says that ISA providers 
could take up to 20% of a graduate's income until their tuition is repaid. So first of all, 20% of your income. Second of all, providers would need to ensure graduates wouldn't pay an effective annual percentage rate greater than, think of a crazy town number. Yeah, you said this to me and I'm like- town interest number. Just don't think people understand interest, you know? Like, Ensure graduates wouldn't pay an effective annual percentage rate greater than 36%. It's just mind-boggling. Shocking. So the Woodstock Institute, which is a hey, Illinois... Real quick, the, yeah. the rule of 72 tells you that, that the amount you would owe at 36%, the amount you would owe would double every two years at 36%. So it's, if you owe 50000 and you're just paying off the, the lowest amount. I don't know. I yeah, mean, it's not good. Don't um, do it. The Woodstock Institute, which is an Illinois based group advocating for fair lending policies, is especially upset because in the bill they're like, oh, but but you have to reach a certain threshold of income before we can start taking this 20 percent. Well, the threshold that they have is twenty nine thousand dollars. So you have to make twenty nine thousand dollars and then we're going to start taking this 20 percent, which is. They're like, hey, that's not even a living wage in most of Illinois, much yeah. less 20% of that small number is going to be really crippling for some students. So got to go back to that's, the drawing board on that one. That's $14 an hour if you just worked a 40-hour. $29,000 equals $14 an hour. Okay. All right. Um, the, I have three more for you. I'm going to go quickly through all three of these. So the first one comes out of WGBH in Massachusetts. It's an article I would encourage you to read. It's about the hidden cost of transferring to a four-year college. Uh -huh. um, a couple of case studies in there. They talk about a student, William, who is the son of Kenyan immigrants. He worked really, really hard and he graduated from high school with a high school diploma as well as an associate's degree from his local community college. So he just went the whole time, got his associate's degree, then got accepted to the University of Chicago. The University of Chicago has a um, just blanket statement that they do not accept any transfer credits from two-year schools. So none of that work that he did transferred to the University of Chicago. And he was I like... I went and double checked that. And that is true. Yeah. So among students who transfer, about 43% of their college credits don't end up counting towards a new degree, which is pretty amazing, especially because there's sort of this sub story of like, hey, but if you graduate, if, if you go to community college, then you're, the goal is for you to have a pathway forward, right? Yeah. Um, a lot of schools are trying to address this, like they're crafting these policies, but there's no guidance and there's no follow up on it. So 38 states, including Massachusetts, have general education courses guaranteed to transfer across all public post-secondary institutions, but they don't track whether a student's credit actually make the transition and save them money. When this news association went to the Department uh, of Higher Education in Massachusetts, the department couldn't tell them what percentage of a student's community college credits ultimately transferred. So it's just a really big problem. And one of the fundamental things in this article is talking about how students are not well advised. I don't think this is true of most advisors, but the premise in this article is that advisors don't want to tell students that the credits at their school aren't going to count if they transfer because it is a benefit to the school for the student to pay for it there. And it doesn't really matter to the school if the student has to pay for it again, right? I don't think our people do that, but you can understand that the incentive is set up badly in that case. So broken. Also, sorry, one more thing about this that's a little strange, which is um, University of Chicago, I think like other schools, accepts AP credits, but not right. credits from a two-year college. So these students are like, how is it I have college degree, like college uh, credit? Associate degree, yeah. Yeah, and that doesn't count. But if I took high, high school AP test, you would count it, which we all know that students who have access to AP tests tend to be in a higher socioeconomic level. And so it punishes students who maybe don't have access to that. So something's got to be done there. That's a little bit broken. Oh, okay. man. There's just a whole lot we can say about that. Yeah. 
Okay, I'm going to skip this next one. We'll talk about it next week or, yeah, next week. Um, I want to go into the U.S. news rankings. Um, this is a little bit funny. I'll try not to be snarky about it, but it's I'm a little entertained. So you remember that about seven months ago, a bunch of Ivy League schools were like, we think U.S. news rankings and World Report is stupid. We're not doing it. We're not going to participate. We're not giving you our data. We don't care if you leave us out. Whatever. It's dumb. We don't have to. We're Yale. We're Harvard. We're good. Right. Well, um, just last week, I think. Yeah, last week, the new U.S. News previewed its first ranking since these schools decided to boycott for the top dozen or so law and medical schools only. And now a lot of those schools that boycotted them are very upset about the outcomes. Um, in fact, they are so upset and they made such a kerfuffle about it about the methodology that the U.S. News announced on Wednesday that they had indefinitely postponed the rankings official publication. So they're like, we're not even going to, we don't know when we're, if ever, going to show you what these rankings are. It's not so much that they fell. So like Yale stayed one, Harvard got replaced. Like it's not so much that they fell. It's that their outcomes, like their aftergraduate employment rate, Yale is like, we're at 100%. And U.S. News report is like, no, by our calculations, you're at 80 percent employment. And Yale's like, what? That is not true. You, ha you can't tell people that. So there's all of these things because of the way they adjusted what they were doing, that these elite schools are like, how dare you say that about us? We're amazing. Um, it's this like double edged sword, right, where these schools are like, hey, if you're going to produce rankings, your data has to be right. And U.S. News report is like, but you're not cooperating with us. So how would we get the right data? So they don't want to play, but also they don't want to be dropped in the rankings. So sorry. Um, one really interesting thing that they did, though, is they changed all of their metrics, right? So this haggling of how you decide what employment means and what data you're looking at, it reveals the arbitrariness of data that can be disrupted by simple changes in metrics, right? So all we did was we just adjusted this over here and then you're now you're comparing apples to oranges because it's not consistent year after year. So it looks like Yale dropped 20% in employment and they're like, we didn't, that's not true. Pretty interesting. Yeah. I think it's a good setup uh, for our subject. A really, really nice transition to our topic today. Yeah. That is the state of the union. So today our topic is accurate data growing pains, the growing pains of having accurate data. And I have to tell you, Matt, Allison is joint, has joined us on LinkedIn Live. She is one of our clients who is an outlier for us because she's in charge of institutional research, but she is so student success focused that that is, I mean, she just is constantly talking about how we use data to support our students and our practitioners. So I'm a little bit nervous to talk about data. <laughs> she's going to be high five you. Okay. Time. All right. I hope so. So let me set the stage for this conversation. This is coming out of a couple of different places. There is a really um, remarkable article. Uh, it's not an article. It's like a it's like a workbook that came out of the Complete College America. I don't know if you're familiar with them. They are their mission is basically a national advocate for increasing college completion rates and closing institutional performance gaps by working with state systems, institutions and partners to scale highly effective structural reforms and promote policies that improve student success. So they think about policy perspective and practice. Um, I would recommend that you download this workbook. It is so extensive that I can't even scratch the surface of what they've done. But they're trying to deliver to you a complete package for how you use data specifically to improve student success. And so awesome. they talk about KPIs and where the data comes from and how you need to talk about it and all of that stuff. So we're going to be pulling some of that. Um, so I read that paper. And then also, Matt, you know that we're at the place we talked about how to tell your story of student success a couple of weeks ago. We are at the place where we're starting to talk about these outcome measurements of interventions that people have been doing. And I have just recently, with a lot of schools that we're working with, uncovered this sort of strange narrative about where data comes from and what we can do with it. Yeah. 
And I want to address it because I think it's a fair narrative given their experience with data, but it is not a realistic narrative given what actually happens with data. So we're going to talk about how you can kind of uncover some of those pieces um, with the data collection and how you use data and how you talk about data to set you up then for your summer project of getting your data worked out so that then in the fall you can start measuring the right stuff. Does that make sense in terms of context? Yeah, and I think it's really important to say that even if you're you're a data novice, like you're not an expert, you're not a database administrator, you're not the person who's, you know, typically in charge of data, that's okay because like if I if I could put you in charge of, hey, can you make sure that we have what we need? You're like this is what I I need to have. So, yeah, I'm yeah. going to go pursue that. So I just I think it I think that's really important, Matt, because I would actually say that our audience for today are people who are not as involved in the data piece. Yeah. And and that's part of what's hard is that there's like this abstraction of like data. Like I can just go in the SIS and there's data, but there's this whole process that you have to understand in order then to make requests for data to understand where it comes from, right? So it's a really important point that we are not in any way talking today about hard data measurements. We are talking about the kind of the, the what's that? Like the environment of data on your campus and how you yeah. can understand it. So, so the way I, I've been thinking about today is, so this is, we're talking about data, but what we're really talking about is useful data, which is intelligence, which makes your work better. And it, so it's useful that you can, you can then tell other people about it, what's yeah. happening. You can tell a story. You can also put it into your, your student success management system. And so you have a better picture of who you're, you're working with yeah. and tell more outcomes. So to me, it's, we, we're talking about data, but for me, it's about intelligence and something that's useful. And you have to go to the beginning in order for it to be useful. So, Okay. So this is a thing that happens to us a lot at Ferris because we, um, as we support our clients, we are taking data that maybe no one has ever paid attention to before. Like it lives somewhere. And maybe when I'm working with a student, I go into the SIS and I look at it, but, but we take data and we make it visible. And there's a very painful process when you start making data visible because everyone's like, wait, what is this and where did it come from and what does it mean and why is it like that? And right. So that's what we want to talk about. We have this process with our clients where we say, I don't know what this data means. You're sending it to us and we're showing it to you for the first time. And then we have to do this kind of uncovering of what this means. And Matt, you know, this happens to us sometimes where a school's like, well, can't you just show us? something. Can't you just show us our first generation students? And we're like, of course we can show that to you. Where would we get that information? And they're like, well, we don't collect that. Okay. Myth number one, <laughs> we cannot show you data that does not exist somewhere. Right. And it's a, it's kind of, I'm, it sounds snarky, but, but that is actually a really, really important thing. Yeah. That if you say, can you just show me blah, 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 your very first question is, where would that be collected, right? Help me understand where in the process of student engagement from admissions all the way through, where would that be collected? Um, and if the answer is no one is collecting that, then the response is we cannot show it to you then, right? Uh, I, there are lots of examples of this. But just this idea that, um, and, and to be really transparent, Matt, you know, in our office, we have a bunch of people who have worked in higher education for a long time in financial aid and registrar's office and advising. I was talking to my coworkers this morning and I was like, hey, how does that data get in the SIS? And nobody knew. We have no idea how at the schools we worked at, the data, like the bulk of the data is that coming from admissions and then they input it somehow? Is there a special process? Like, it's okay if you are on campus and you have no idea how data gets into the SIS. Right. I don't know the answer to that in the schools that I've worked at. Um, okay. So I, I'm getting worked up about it. So the first thing is data collection. 
who, where is the data collected and who is in charge of it? So if we go in and we say, I want to understand where we're getting something like first generation college students. Is admissions asking that? No, admissions isn't asking that. Okay, well, if that's really important to you, then you need to go to them and ask them, please, will you collect this, right? But the other piece of that is so often we collect a bunch of noisy data that nobody ever does anything with. And so if I'm in charge of collecting something like denomination or first generation or college le uh, parents level of college experience, Higher education, yeah. Yeah. And I'm like, I don't know why I'm doing this. Nobody ever talks about it. Nobody ever does. Nobody does anything. It is low on my priority list. If I skip it, it doesn't matter. I might have been skipping it for the last five years and nobody has ever said to me, why are you skipping this field? Which tells me it's not super important. Yeah. Do you have more you want to say about that? Well, I'm just thinking about there's so many different examples of that that we've come across. Yeah. So. Um, so being able to go back to whoever is in charge of collecting that data, whether it's coming out of admissions or the registrar, or there's a lot of different places where we collect data, being able to go back to somebody who might be in charge of collecting it and saying, hey, this piece of data is really, really important because I'm going to run these reports on retention and I want to disaggregate it by first generation student, a college student, so that I know whether or not we're supporting supporting that population the way we need to, all of a sudden you've given them a good reason to keep track of that because now somebody cares about it, right? So this idea of who collects it, where do they collect it, how does it get into your official record, your SIS? Um, and Matt, you and I were talking about the, the various places in the life cycle stream of a student where you might collect information. So we were talking about a uh, major, so when I look at a student's major in the SIS, is that coming from their application when they're a junior in high school? And right. we just like, oh, psychology, okay, that's her major. Is that coming from a conversation with admissions when they're close to being accepted? Is that coming from a conversation with the first year experience instructor in the first semester that says, let's choose and confirm your major? Depending on when that data is being collected and who it's being collected by, you're going to have various answers. And so it's not just who's collecting it. It's when they're collecting it. Right. Yep. And, and really out of all of those sources, which one is the, is the preferred source? Right. Yeah, so absolutely. You were saying something about even student, um, student submitted data, right? Yeah. So, I mean, if, if a student, so if they're filling out a non-cognitive um, and this is, so you touched on a couple of them, where like self-reported high school GPA versus official transcript high school GPA, yeah, right? Or um, parents' highest level of education. Well, I live with my mom, so I thought about her, and so I put hers, but my, my dad has a master's degree, and I didn't record that, right? Yeah. So, I mean, that student submitted, um, that's where I'm saying, like, which of these sources is the right one? that you want to go with. So when we talk with practitioners, that's part of the process we walk through, right? Which is like, we have three places where majors collected, which one is most actionable for you? Is it student report or is it what they said, you know, when to an admissions counselor, when they just had to check the box. So the very first question there is how is it captured and where is it captured? And so we think about action items there in terms of clear data collection policies and procedures. We know what we collect, why we collect it, who collects it, and when. And I go back, Rachel, like I was saying, so if you're not a data expert, you could just make sure your campus has this really clearly defined. So I could just see you, Rachel, going and saying, like, where did this come from? Yeah. How do we know that this was collected the right way and that we're going to be consistent in the way that we collect it? And also, you'd be great at telling them the why it's important. Yeah, the next action item is about training staff on data. And we're going to talk a little bit more about that. But we were saying earlier, this idea of everybody in the room should be able to be a data guardian because they understand how data informs our practices. So we're not really talking about like reporting for iPads, although that's incredibly important. 
we're actually talking about, um, I, I was thinking about like a school who maybe hasn't been sending us financial aid information. And somebody somewhere along the line makes the decision like, oh, we're not going to collect that anymore or we're not going to send that anymore or whatever, right? And then you have a practitioner who goes in, has a whole process of looking at financial aid information or financial holds, and they go into the system and that do it doesn't exist anymore. And the reason that would happen is because there was nobody in the room when the decision was made to stop collecting that or sending it who could say, hold on, that's really important to our practitioners and here's what they do with it, right? So you have to train everybody so that there are always representatives who are going to say, wait a minute, if we change that or if we change the metric or if we tweak that um, equation, who is it going to affect on campus? I know in Spark meetings, we talk about that piece every single time you can't right. get rid of it, right? right? Um, we talk about standardized data collection tools. So this is another piece. SIS is super helpful for that. One of the things that I find a lot of times on a campus that people don't know is that SIS has a lot of fields that you probably are not populating. So you have somebody on campus who if you went and said, we want to start capturing athlete by sport. So we understand that you put athletics in there, but we need to have a field so that we can see, are they a football player? Or are they a volleyball player? Or are they a softball player, right? That somebody in IT or IR would say, I have a field where you can start putting that, we'll know where it lives, and then we can start sending it over so that you can use that in your um, in your practice. But the idea yeah. that you have these fields that you can utilize for different pieces of data that you maybe haven't collected before, I think is really important. I wrote down, I'm so glad you used that as an example, because I wrote down, do you remember the time that we received what was a scan? I think it was a fax. I, I don't I know. You're right. It was a handwritten oh, yeah. list of student athletes by sport, handwritten on a piece of paper, not captured in an Excel or anything, their hearts. and sent to us. And they just, were like, hey, can you just put this in the system? And we're like, no, I mean, I'm glad you collected it. That's super helpful, right? That's the yeah. first piece. Do yeah. we have it? But then the second piece is, is it in a format that we then can get into the system, right? And so yeah. we had to go back and say, you need to go to IT and talk about how we can get this in the system so that then it's part of that nightly upload that you're sending us. Um, yeah. yeah, that was pretty rough. That was a Well, rough. and that leads to the to the last thing, I would just say you have to use technology. Um, so if you think about your ecosystem, all the different sources, all the different places that are storing data, which one is your system of record? I was thinking about how we collect contact information, but it's not the official record. And yeah. if you want it to be, we have an extract for that, but to make sure all of your systems are talking and that you have that primary a uh, system of record on your campus that has all of that data up to date. Yeah, we talk about it in terms of kind of a fusion or like a data lake where we're bringing all of that data together. Right. And one of the things that's really helpful about that, not only can you mix it all up and it's going to make your reporting powerful, but also then you have this process of transparency. We are looking at, we collect this three different ways or three different times and then you're able to see, oh, these are all different. We need to decide which one we want to use best, right? right? But having that comparison, I always say it's kind of like, like if you don't have the put it on the put the data on the table so we can see it, then you have no way of knowing whether it's accurate, right? This would actually be my MO where I just like would run a, a export and I'd be like, this is what the numbers say. And people would be like, how do you know that's true? And I'm like, because that's what Excel <laughs> told me. Instead of being like, wait, how can I actually validate this to say those are the right numbers? I'm working with good data. Um, that's good. Okay, I want to say one more thing about that, because another sort of sticking point sometimes for schools is that you might know your data is not good. You don't want anyone to see it. And it's going to be very painful. And I would just say that is 100% true. If your data is not good, it is going to be very, very painful to uncover it, but you can fix it. Um and sometimes there's a like, we don't want to look at it because we have bad data. If you think that you have bad data, the only way to fix it is to look at it, right? 
And there is no easy midstream process to get good data other than to acknowledge oh, this is going to be really painful <laughs> as we recognize we're not doing a great job of, of data collection. I mean, how many schools have we talked to and they're like, oh, we're just not ready for your system That's because right. our data is not right. And we're like, let's just get started so you can see. That's exactly right. right. That's what I was going to say is that this actually is a tool in the right direction. If yeah. you don't have good data, the first step is to put it in a place where people can see it and talk about it and verify it because um, you're not ever going to be able to. It, you can't get your data straight enough to then be ready for everyone to look at it. Nope. Everyone has to look at it and then you make these changes to it. So, OK, which leads me to the next piece of data, which is about definitions and so this is in our conversation today because I can't tell you how many times I think we're, to, I, I have a definition of what the data is that we're looking at. And after a lot of confusing conversation, I realize I forgot to say the definition out loud. And so we've been talking about two different things with the school, right? Right. So you think about retention and persistence is one of those things. Um, where you just have to be very explicit when you are having data conversations, you have to say, just as a reminder, this is what I mean when I use these terms, Matt, we have one, which is FTF zero, right? Which yeah. we use all the time, but schools sometimes are not familiar with it. Well, I think we made it up. So I understand. Oh, okay. Well, you know, but <clears throat> FTF zero is a student who's on your campus and they did not transfer in any of those AP or dual credit uh, hours. And so they're literally coming in with zero credit hours. And these are the, in general, the most at-risk students on your campus. Yeah. Now what's interesting is the percentage mix. Some schools have like University of Chicago, because they accept AP, they're gonna have a large number of students who are um, FTF plus, you know, one plus. But FTF zeros, some of our campuses, that's primarily who they're recruiting. It's yeah. really an important piece to know. And and to define so that everybody in the room understands. Yeah. So I there's no shame in this. I just wanted to tell you, as I was talking about, as I was thinking about like definitions and how we define things, I was going in to see what is the official de uh, definition of retention and persistence. So we have a definition we use when we're doing our spark reports, but listen to this. This is a crazy town to me. So I found this article came out of Noel Levitt's uh, retention certificate uh, co codifications is the name of the article. So the term retention and persistence are frequently employed interchangeably. Attempts to differentiate the terms have not been successful. For example, it's been suggested that retention is an institutional level measure of success and persistence is an individual or student level measure of persist, per, of success. So this is saying like, hey, retention is whether or not you keep a student. Persistence is whether or not the student persists in college, whether at your college or another college. So there's one definition, right? Yeah. Then we have our, um, let's see, PDP definition, which is coming out of the National Student Clearing Clearinghouse, their definition of retention is how many students are still enrolled before the end of the student's second academic year. Okay, so four full semesters, they want four full semesters. You came in as a freshman, semester, semester, came back, semester, semester. Okay, so that's another definition. Okay. Then we have the iPads definition, which is a measure of the rate at which students persist in their educational program at an institution expressed as a percentage. For four-year institutions, this is the percentage of first-time bachelors or degree-seeking undergraduates from the previous fall who are now enrolled in the current fall. Okay, that's iPads. Noel Levitz says that it is, oh no, I might have lost it, hold on. Uh, Noel Levitt says retention is the outcome of how many students remained enrolled fall to fall. This number is typically derived from first time, full time, traditional day students, but can be defined by any cohort, applied to any cohort. OK. You can understand why it's super important that we have definitions, because depending on what we're talking about, iPads or 
any of these others, our numbers are going to look really different and we're going to be having totally different conversations. That's not even, that's, I'm, I didn't even bring into it all of the student success retention definitions, which are like retention is about how well a student engages across, whatever. You get my point. Yeah. Definitions are super important. And when we're talking about them, we have to make sure everybody in the room understands what we're saying. Dan Nelson at Bethel University is so good at this. Every yeah. time he's in a Spark meeting, he'll start off and, and make sure everyone in the room understands this number that they're talking about of number of first-time freshmen. Here's what that means, and he'll break it down. Their first time full-time enrolled. This is their first time at any college and, and explains it. And it's so helpful for the room yeah. And Dan's such a great voice for the room. So now what he's done is as a great partner, if there's anyone with a question around the table, they're not asking us. They're just asking Dan for that clarification. He's the person on their campus who he's kind of the keeper of the definitions. And yeah. I, and I really love that as you're just emphasizing, you need to have this, uh, not only a person, but to have it documented. This is when we're talking about this we have to be consistent. Let's not go into the board meeting and right. start talking about retention when that was that is not retention. That is that is spring into fall, not fall into fall. That's right. right. Yeah, because the yeah, your expectation of persistence versus retention are going to be really different, obviously. Or when uh, you talk about retention, that are you talking like you just have to define it in, right. in detail. We're talking about our first time freshmen, not all freshmen. Right. or all enrolled students, which, you know. You can talk about that, but that's sure. not what iPads is asking you to report on, right? That's right. So I think on your campus, having this general understanding, I was on a campus the other day and they were talking about students from under-resourced families. What on that campus, what that means is students from a particular band of socioeconomic level and so everyone on the campus knows when I say a student from an under-resourced family that I'm talking about this band of students, right? So that might that's not going to mean the same thing or anything maybe on another campus that I go to. I would have to then introduce, hey, here's the language we're going to use and here's what that's referring to. So you just have to hey, be yeah. very clear. And, and I'll, here's one that just came up with a Spark meeting where we were talking about, we've always talked about it in terms of scholarships. So students with this scholarship, but Viva saw that the retention for this level, this named scholarship changed dramatically. And because Viva is a sleuth, yeah. she, she got down into it, started researching the dollar amount and the dollar amount changed completely. Mm. And so everyone thought like, so let's just say it's the provost award. And everyone thought that that was just, you know, so... Uh, exceptional, but they cut the award in half. They moved it to a, a different award that changed everything. And yeah. so if you're looking, what happened to the provost award? It's not the provost award. It's the amount of money. So, so we have a new definition that we need to say, Hey, it used to mean this, but now it means this different. And I would say right. percentage of tuition covered, right? So then it's always this award is this percentage tuition covered that that's a helpful way of, of knowing how much aid you're actually giving a student with that. So that was one that came up. That was, if, if she hadn't caught that, we would have been confused about, you know, what, what happened? Did you give that to the wrong student? No, we changed, we just changed the Change amounts. The definition. Yeah. We changed the amounts. Not it. Yeah. Um, it's very complicated. Right. It's just, the, it's just, yeah, defining of terms and there's some best practices, right? So there are, there are schools sometimes that are like, oh, but we define this this way. And we're like, okay, you're allowed to define it that way, but that is not what the rest of the world is going to think when you use that number. So I was talking to a school the other day, not one of our clients, who was telling me that on their campus, they have chosen to define success. They don't look at freshman retention. They are choosing to define success as of the sophomore cohort. So any, forget about freshmen, like forget about you lost 50% of your freshmen. I don't care. I'm not, that's not how I'm defining success. 
I am looking of the sophomores that came back. The number that we want to talk about is of those sophomores, how many of them came back for their junior year? And they're <laughs> like, we have great success with that, right? When you cut out yeah, the 95%. Right. When you cut out the 50% of the freshmen who didn't come back, we don't care. We just look at these that are committed for their sophomore year and do they continue on into their junior year? That number sounds amazing. Yes, you have defined success on your campus that way. Nobody else is going to be impressed with that number, <laughs> right? Because that is not how we talk about those things. Yeah. So, you just skip past all the attrition. Right. right? Yeah, exactly. Okay. So you have <clears throat> to have this definition piece. The next thing is data transparency. We've talked about this a little bit. You have to put it out so that everybody can see it. And you want to talk about what do you have and then what do you not have. And if so, when we're thinking about outcome measurements, we never want to start with, well, what do you have that we could measure? We want to start with what is important to measure for this intervention or this cohort or whatever. What is important? And then do you have it? And if no, how do the, we start collecting it, right? But yeah, you yeah. don't want to build your measurements based on what is. You want to say, here's what would be a good thing to measure. And then here's how we're going to start collecting it. And you all, when you're working with our, with our schools, you give them. These are best practice. These are all the things that you'll want to look at. And, and they can go through then and say, we have it. We're not sure where it comes from or we definitely don't have it. Yeah, Matt. I mean, one of the things we started doing a long time ago, which I would just encourage everybody to do is we have IT, IR, um, and then practitioners in the room. And we say, here's 212 best practice fields that you should be collecting. And then there's just a round table conversation about, oh, I know where that lives. Yes, we have that. No, we don't collect that. Well, we should collect that. Well, where could we yeah. put it? Right. It's just a great summer meeting to have to say, Here's everything that we think is going to be really relevant. Can we just talk about where the gaps are? So I really love that practice. Um, talking about is it accurate and consistent? We've already talked a little bit about that. Well, the consistent part. I mean, when yeah. when you see this this variable suddenly goes to majority null, right? Um, <clears throat> let's catch that as early on as we can. Sometimes we find that that's because it just didn't get transferred over to the SIS. Because this student actually was a late admit, and they they finally got all the data in the system later, and never reported on it. Right. Um, I also want to say that in data transparency, we have this issue of FERPA and aggregate versus personally identifiable information. So I just, I, this is really, really important. So I just want to camp on it for a minute. Schools usually tend obviously towards one side of the spectrum under FERPA, like nobody can know anything about anyone or we are going to share everything about everything. So remember FERPA is educationally appropriate for somebody to know. So that can be really good guidance as long as you have the technology in place that gives you that fine grain control over who can see what, then you should be able to share that information generally with anyone who's in the relationship constellation and is concerned with the student being educationally successful. That's what educationally appropriate. We're not gossiping. We're not telling everybody everything about every student, but we're saying if you are connected to that student, then you have a right to know things that are going to help you promote their educational success, right? But the other thing is your president and your board members and your provost and your VP for student success, although they don't need to see by student name what's going on, you should be giving them aggregate data that tells them here are the kind of issues that are coming up in referrals. Here are the things that we're talking about in advising. This is what's happening in our career center. So the idea that you are making that data available in aggregate to people who need to understand the story but you have to have confidence in it in order to be able to do that. So I think both FERPA and that aggregate personal identifiable data is really, uh, really important. Okay. Um, Matt, we are running out of time. So can you talk about. Who knew, who knew we could run so long on data? On data? <laughs> can you talk about this idea of conducting regular data audits? I think that's a great action item. Number four, um, like yeah. here's what's important as we're thinking about that transparency. So uh, just that data collection, this is where you just go back and you're saying, are we, are we still collecting this? Is it relevant? Are we, 
collecting the right thing. So it's looking for ways of improvement. Just this, yeah. this audit of how are we collecting it? Is it accurate? Is it complete? Um, are we able to use this in our measurements? So you mentioned athletics. It's so, so I love that because if we're collecting athlete, if we're being real, we can say these are low risk. There are low risk sports and there are high risk sports. But if we can't break that down, this athlete piece really is, is a misdirection, right? right. So, <clears throat> so just that whole process of looking at the data, what do we have? Is it still, are we still collecting that in the right way? Last week we talked about siblings and how there's, there's this, um, some financial aid impact of whether or not they have other siblings in college. Are you collecting that? So throughout the year, are there new data pieces that we need to collect and how are we going to do that? And where do we store that? And then how do we load that in a useful system so that we can manage based on that? And I think that's a team. Like I said, I think you need practitioners. I think you need someone from admissions. I think you need IR. I think you need IT to be able to have those conversations twice a semester. What's new? What's changed? Um, thinking about the idea of like data governance, who is in charge of what? Also, who is allowed to change stuff? Am I allowed to just right. go in and change something in the SIS or no, you're not allowed to do that. That has to come officially from this person, right? So just uh, this feeds into this last piece about a data-driven culture where we are continually having conversations about our data, where we are picking a thing and getting started and saying it's going to be painful, but we're going to start measuring this thing. Um, and, and measuring what matters. So Matt, you know, a lot of times we'll talk to a school and they're like, well, can we see that by this, 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 this. And we're like, absolutely help me understand what you're going to do with that. And they're like, oh, well, I'm just curious. Okay. That's great. If you've got a lot of time on your hands, but if we're taking baby steps, we want to start with a data driven culture that measures what matters, not just, let's just see what the answer to that is. Right. So yeah. having those regular conversations, setting your goals based on data, this is why that registration process is so important because when you have the number in front of you, 50% of our students are registered and our goal for retention is 78, then I understand that my goal is to increase my registration by at least 28% and assume there's not going to be melt over the summer, right? But right. knowing that data... Every morning, looking at the numbers, I improved 10%. I got three more students. Now I've done this. Now I've done this. Those uh, setting goals based on the data that you have is going to be part of that data-driven culture. Um, and then making sure, which I sometimes have to say this over and over for those of us who are in academics, which is your conversation about data should lead to action. It should not just be, huh, right? <laughs> we, have to, we have to be like, great, now what? The reason we named our data analytics service Spark is because we were like, we are not doing descriptive analytics. We are trying to spark a conversation and action items and planning for what are we going to do with this data? So it has to lead to actions. Um, and I have left the last one for you, which is your one of your favorite things to talk about, which you have named. Dust bunny data. And this comes from, Rachel, so many of our schools where so we were talking to a school that was in, in the book, Colleges That Change Students' Lives. And there was a practice in there about some really amazing information they were collecting. And you were like, hey, this is amazing. Where is it? And they're like, ah, it's on the shelf. How do you use that? We don't. Literally nobody looks at it after we collect it. You're killing me, Smalls. What are so you doing? <laughs> Best buddy data is when you collect something and then you just let it sit on the shelf and it collects dust and it could have been useful intelligence. So many ways that that information uh, was then useful once we were able to bring it into the system. Yeah. So it's just that idea of identifying um, if you have a non-cognitive and you ask all of your students to take this, the thriving quotient or the CSI or, you know, hey, we want to know and no one looks at it, yeah. then you have wasted everybody's time and a great opportunity to use really, really valuable information. So dust bunny data, I get think me started. 
Yeah, I think a really good example of this is predictive modeling, right? Where you're like, oh, we have this predictive model. But if you don't have a way to make it obvious to people who interface with students, like when I open a student's page, I need to be able to see where they fall on that predictive score. Not everybody needs to see that. But if sure. I'm going to engage with students, you you can't pay for a predictive model that then it's like somebody on campus knows what that is. But I need to know it because I'm seeing the student. So any way that you're you're taking that data and actually making it actionable for a practitioner or putting it in that data lake so that then you're running these reports based on SIS data, LMS data, engagement data, and non-cognitive data, right? That's a really important practice. And I don't I don't know how schools do that that don't use us, but it's a really important thing to to delve into. How yeah. could we combine all of these things in a way that are going to help us identify our students? So do you have anything else you want to say? No. About that? Okay. So I think that's a helpful context to set. If you have bad data, it is going to be painful, but... These are the things that you want to walk through. Where is it collected? Is it transparent? Is it accurate and consistent? Do you have data that lives in a place that no one ever talks about? How do we create this data-driven culture? I cannot recommend this uh, paper that came out of the CAC highly enough. They actually go through, it's a little bit overwhelming to me, honestly. They're like, here's everything you should measure and where you should get it. And here's like pre-college measurements and post-college me measurements. So don't feel totally overwhelmed by it, but I think there's a lot of really good information in there. And my action item for summer is find a group of people that represent all of those different things that we talked about and just like take the plunge, put the data on the table, say, wow, that's really ugly. And I don't think it's accurate. And this is super overwhelming. Let's go through the process of cleaning it up because you cannot clean it up without that cringe-worthy experience of understanding where the gaps are. And I would just say, if this feels overwhelming to you on your campus, let us know. We'd love to help you. Yeah, for sure. Thanks, guys. Good to see you all. Have a great day. Have a great day.